Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I guess it's already 12.30. I, uh, I seem to have some, some um, internet issues. So today I will, I will experiment with just turning the camera off or the video off, hopefully. This shouldn't cause us any issue. If I get disconnected, please just let me know directly on the chat and uh, I hope it goes smoothly. This lecture is already uh, uploaded. I will look into the chat right now for a couple of questions uh, as usual before we start. Uh, and then we can see what we are going to discuss today. Abigail, I cannot get the terminal on Eclipse to work. Can I use the terminal that's on my computer? Is it the same thing? Yes, it's exactly the same thing, Abigail. Uh, <coughs> uh, you, you need the terminal only for get commands. It's completely independent of Eclipse. So that's completely fine, no worries. Um, Katie, for the method Boolean, it describes an error message but doesn't throw an exception. Should we make it through an exception? Also, are we allowed to use dot length in our code? So Katie, the first question, I guess someone else already also uh, asking me about it. Um, I will look into the lab after the lecture and then send, send an announcement about it. Uh, with regard to using the length for your code, if you are not instructed not to do so, then yes, you are free to, to use it. But if you are inst instructed um, not to use, because I don't remember to be honest, but I don't, I don't think there was any constraint on using the dot length method. So I would say, yes, you can use it. Uh, Yan Hao for the workplace of Eclipse, it just means the path you save your file. That's correct. It's Yan Hao, it's the default one that Eclipse opens when you open Eclipse for the first time, it, it has to find a certain directory to open and, and workplace is usually the default one. That's correct. Okay, good. So uh, today today's lecture is, is, I believe, I would say it's, it's a bit of a theoretical uh, lecture, like th th there isn't much coding, but I would say it's one of the most impo important lectures we are covering in object-oriented programming. And the concept we, we, we discuss in this lecture we discussed briefly before across different lectures, as you will see, we are putting pieces of information together, but I hope by today's lecture, the main concept becomes clearer for you because it's a fundamental concept in object-oriented programming and you really need it uh, for, for, for Java in this class, for, for lab uh, five, because we are doing linked lists there and also for 2SI or any other programming course you take. So it's a fundamental concept for object-oriented programming, no matter what language you use, right? And I intentionally make this lecture independent of Java, in fact. I, I would rather uh, focus on the concept. And if you've got questions, please ask, okay? So let's start from things we already know. Uh, we covered this already in C and in Java. I hope some of you remember, uh, uh, and I will keep kind of discussing with you and asking questions in the meantime to refresh your minds. So simply we said that in any language has its own inherent data types. Uh, for example, in Java, you have int, boolean, string. Um, for C, we don't have boolean, but we have int, float, double string, etc. So each language defines its own inherent data types. You don't need to do anything to implement these types. They are already there and simply you can use them, right? But then when we discuss C, I guess in the second lecture and also Java in the first lecture, we said data type defines three things uh, for the variable. So simply any data type has three characteristics or three features that are necessary and that defines this data type. That's the main reason why we have different data types. Does anyone remember any of the three? So simply if I just define how I think about these things, Say, for example, I define index. What does this really represent? Size of memory, how much memory exactly, Daniel? Yeah, and, uh, and, and yes, yeah, that's, that's correct memory and how as well. Um, Nicole said functions or what operation as well, that's correct. So now we, we mentioned two things. The size that this variable is going to occupy in memory, we said, for example, int would be 32 bytes in C, floats or double double especially might be 64 byte a single um, character is just one byte so now we are talking about how much memory this variable is going to occupy correct the second thing is what are the operations or functions you can operate or you can do or you can perform on this variable 
For example, I can, uh, uh, to give an example, I can add two integers in C, but you cannot just directly add two strings, right? You have to do it in a certain way. So what operation, what value? Uh, yeah, and then the list, the, 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 the third thing you'll end, I, yeah, correct, the third thing would, was what are the values that this variable can get? For example, if it's an int x, x cannot have floating point representation. So it, it also puts a constraint on what are the values that this variable can get. Perfect. So these are the three things. Thanks, everyone. So a data type represents the set of possible values. For example, Boolean true or false. And as we were saying, it's, it's just a, like um, a, a decimal representation without floating point, and floating point would get a fraction. Correct. Uh, and another advantage, and we'll come into the, like the, the remaining two right now, but another advantage of, of this three things you guys mentioned is that we let the compiler to simply help us find the errors in our code. What I mean by this, assume you define a variable that is int, for example, and then you, don't, you want to do some kind of operation that is not allowed for int. So the compiler will catch this and will give you an error message if it's not able to cast, for example, right? So also defining variables as uh, like as with the correct type, we help the compiler to catch what is allowed and what is not allowed. Because where, where I get this from, from the three things, I got it from the feature that says a type defines what are the set of operations you can perform in the variable, right? So those set of operations are already defined by the language. The compiler already knows them, which means uh, the compiler can it check whether you are doing a valid operation or not in the variable once you define its type, correct? Um, yeah, so we already also mentioned this. So the set of values, the data representation, uh, and uh, the set of operations you can have, like uh, data representations, how much memory assembly you, you, can, you can add. And then in Java, we had primitive types that we discussed simply the R8, Boolean, this is just a review, character byte short uh, and long, float double. And we, as, as we said, each one has its own set of values. And if you remember in, in the first and second lecture in Java, we had a table that says for Boolean, for example, it takes 16 bit, the values are either true or false. And uh, like simply what operations you can do on, on that, good. And these things, you cannot change these types. You have nothing to do with this. Simply you can just use them, but, but you cannot modify them. Why we are saying all of this? Because one of the main things we discussed, this is the, uh, like a simplification of the table we were, we were discussing. But one of the main concepts I wanted to convey to you when we discussed classes and even structures in C is that those are nothing other than defining your own data type, right? So simply, if you understand this concept, you can really deal with classes and structures and classes in Java and structures in C as if they are data types you use them to define variables and you operate in these variables. Right? There are some differences as we have seen and we will see in this lecture, but inherently those classes are nothing other than a data type you define yourself. Good. Uh, and then the possible values, I mean variables that or in instances that you define out of this classes is just the objects we define. And also <clears throat> by, by declaring an object or, or uh, we, we said for an object, there are two, uh, I would say you need two statements or two pieces of code. The first one is declaring this object, which is defining the reference. The second one is allocating it in memory. If you remember, if we had a class, let's say point, if we do something like point, point one, we call this declaration. And this only defines that there is a reference to the class point called point one, but it does not allocate anything in the memory yet. What you need afterwards is to say point one equal new point. Maybe you send some initializations. And in this case, you go to the memory, the hardware goes to the memory and defines and, and allocates the memory for the point class, including like X, Y, whatever, all the data variables and methods there, right? So the class itself point, now thinking of it from the data type point of view, it told us that once you define a variable out of this, really there is a certain 
memory that you need to allocate. And this size of the memory will be different from one class to the other. Why it would be different from one class to the other? Because it depends on how many variables are there and how many methods are there. Simply this memory for the, that the point one is pointing to has a, like a specific size, right? And remember for, in lab three for structures, you have done something like size of and then student, for example, or student pointer, right? Which tells you like how much size is allocated already for the student. And what we said back then is if you add up all the variables of student, add all the memory allocated to them, this gives you the total, the total memory. For example, we had first name, last name, uh, I would say grade one, grade two, if I remember correctly, an ID, and this first name, last name were uh, character arrays, and then grade one, grade two were double, and then the ID was int. If you add up like 32 bytes, 64, 64, and then depends on how much you allocate for this array, adding all of this up gives you the size of the student, right? So going back again to the bigger picture, defining an object of the structure student or generally defining an object of your own data type, which in case of object-oriented programming, it's class, tells you how much memory you need for, for this object. Good. And then what are the set of operations we need for that class? Simply those are the methods we define inside the class, right? If you have three methods in point, for example, you cannot say a point one dot let's say, I don't know, get length, something like this. Why I cannot do this? Because there is no method inside the point class that is called get length, which means by declaring and defining an object of the class point, you also dictate what are the methods or operations you can do on that object. Is there any question so far? As you can see, all of this is really no new information, but just thinking of it from the mentality of, classes are really nothing other than a data type. And by building this, this thought like together, at the end of the lecture, I will let you know why this is even more important than what you think. Good, 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 good. So one thing that I was expecting to find a question about here, which is we said operations on objects are the methods of the define of the class, but methods might, someone can say, but now you are comparing methods with, uh, I would say, operators that we do in the language itself. For example, I can add an int plus int, and this plus is the operator, which means adding two numbers, right? But this is somehow different than a method, right? So how you can compare these two, right? If you think methods or functions in, in C, or like, let's, let's talk about like Java language, like in methods, they fundamentally no different than an operator because you, you simply take inputs, do some calculations on them, some actions on them, and then return something, right? Which is exactly the same thing that an operator is doing, right? While like the syntax is different, but they are doing the same functionality, correct? And even in, in some of you, if you know C++, really you can write a function that overrides the plus operator, for example. So you can define your own operators or it's called operator overloading, which means simply a function does exactly the same thing as a normal operator, like uh, add, subtract, multiply, but in a different way, right? Some of the differences are like an operator is, is simply written as a special character, like plus, 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 increment, and, and even like the conditional checking and or bitwise and, uh, and sometimes some of the operators are prefix, like the increment, pre-increment or pre-decrement or infix, which means you have two operands and the operator is in between them or postfix, like the post increment, for example, right? Uh, and you can simply have only one or two operands. You cannot have more than this. While in a method, Really, you have to use a valid name of your method, so you cannot just be non-alphabetical or special character. You have to start with a character, all the constraints we know. It takes as many input arguments as you wish, not necessarily two, and you return a single type, right? So those, those are some of the differences between a method and operator. But if you can, if you can think of, of that, like what, like what we said, those are only syntax differences 
on how they operate, but the fundamental operation is exactly the same. You do some calculation, right? And if you remember what we said in previous two lectures, how to map an actual use case of an object, real object to a class, we said you need two things for this object. And we give the example of a dog, for example, you need features or characteristics which are defined as in instance variables and you need actions you can call them operations. And those are the methods we define for the class, right? So those methods are exactly the same, like simply they do exactly the same thing as any operator in, in the language, but in a different syntax. Good. This is all what we say. So now let me give you one example. This example will become clearer in subsequent lectures and in the last lab but it will show you why it's important we discuss what we're discussing right now. It's not just a review, right? I'm just like starting from the knowledge you know and take it further to really make the idea crystal clear for you what is an abstract data type, right? Assume we have a list, right? And then we want to insert an item to a list, right? So this list can simply be an array can be a linked list, can be a queue, can be a stack, can be anything. We didn't say, how did we implement this list yet, right? And as we will see later, this is what we mean by an abstract data type. You just have a, a, a type that is called the list and you want to insert a new element into it. Now, I have many ways of inserting an element to a list. I can simply insert this element at the beginning, insert it at the end, inserted in the middle, inserted before a certain element or after a certain element, right? And the same thing applies if you want to remove an element. Think, for example, for the withdraw function, you are withdraw like you're doing in, in, in the lab. What you do is you get a certain index, the ID of the student, you go for the list, you search it, you find the element, remove it, and then shift everything afterwards, right? Uh, what you have done in, in, in lab three for, for C. So like we, whether inserting an element or removing an element, there are multiple ways of doing it, right? Which way I should implement it? This is simply a question you need to answer. This will depend on how you implement your method. But abstractly, you would call, I'm supporting to insert an element to the list. How did I implement it? It would differ from one implementation to the other, right? And then the question we have as, as a software developer, right now you are thinking of, you are doing your own uh, project, you are implementing the class, uh, and then is it a good idea to provide all these functionalities, like inserting anywhere you wish, and you, you provide, I would say, 10 different implementation for in, implementations for insertion, 10 different implementations for search, 10 different implementations for deletion, all these things. This is a question that you you would need to answer, right? Is this a good idea to supply all of this? What do you think? Is this really a good idea to provide it? Like, like, is it always good? Is it always bad? What What do you think? Any Any hint? Can you think of when this can be good? For example may not be a good as it allows lots of control over your personal code. Katie, that's that's an excellent point. You are correct. This is one of the disadvantages. Maybe really if you are implementing a specific project, it doesn't need all this functionality and then it's not good to provide all this control because again, more functionality would also would require more debugging, more uh, prone to error and may like more verification time, all these things, right? And, and the same thing, more control, as you said, more exposure of your code to the, to the outer user, right? What might be the advantage? Assume, for example, you are not implementing a certain project, you are implementing something like a general or generic API. What, what do you mean by API? It's like a library that you provide, like for example, for anyone to use. Then it might be good. Uh, yeah, as, 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 you, as you also said, Katie, it might be unknown what would be the, the use case. And this is an example of a generic API or generic library, and then it might be good to provide all of this, right? So it will really depend on the use case, right? And this is one of the questions that abstraction data type, as we will see right now, is also trying to attempt to, to, to simplify the answer for, good? Then what are also some of, so we already discussed this when we came into uh, the interface or the contract between the class and 
uh, the outside world, which what we call encapsulation in OOB terminology. Uh, and we said, you don't really need to provide so much information for the implementation that is not really needed for security reasons and also integra integrability, uh, code extensions and different versioning, etc. right? And then this also addresses what we call it, for example, cognitive load. If, if you provide a very complex implementation of, of a class for a user, it might be even very complex to use, right? So you want to simplify stuff. So you want them to be useful, usable, feasible, and at the same time, easy to, to use, right? Because usability, so this is not the, the topic of this course, but software usability is really a, a research on its own. Like th there are some grad courses that, that, is, uh, that are only for software usability, right? How to write your code in a certain way to make it really usable and you, you simplify or facilitate the extension and usage of your code, right? And usually there is a trade-off, as we will see right now, between usability and uh, code functionality, right? Or efficiency. The other factor that you want, like for, so simply just make, make sure you are in, in, in the flow, right? Now we are trying to take a simple question like this, and see how abstract data type can help us address all the trade-offs. So we said one of the disadvantages is really you don't want to provide too much information because of the cognitive load, because of usability, because of security reasons. And uh, the other thing is you want to be as much efficient as, as you would, right? As you can. Um, for example, if, if I think of a list example that I gave you, if I have an array, because I didn't see how did I implement this list yet, but the way you have done this in, in lab three, for example, you have implemented using a dynamically allocated array, correct? So if I have an array and I want to insert an element to this array, what do you think? What is more efficient to insert? Should like, let's say this is I mean, zero, one, two, three, four, right? And I want to insert, uh, these are five elements. I want to, to insert a sixth element. Should I insert it? at the beginning or should I insert it at the end? What do you think? What is more efficient from the array point of view? At the end for sure, right? Because at the beginning, you would have to shift all the elements down, right? So you have to take all the elements of the array one by one and shift them one step further. But if you just append at the end, it's just a single, uh, a single operation, right? That's perfect. On the other hand, as we will see in the, in the linked list data structure, which is an, a way to implement the list, it's really doesn't, like it's much easier, let's say, it's not different to, to append at the beginning or the end based on the linked list, but let's say, if you don't have the end of your list, and you don't need now to understand what is a linked list, we have lectures for that, but, but simply think of those entries here, of the array, as if they are, different objects, right? Now we know classes, so they are different objects and every object is pointing to the other object, good? And I only have, I would say a pointer or a reference to the first element. Let's call this first or head. Now, what do you think of this? Now, assume you, do, you know nothing at all about data structures. I just told you, this is a possible implementation. You have these four objects, just to continue with the example, say we have five similar to the array. And then you only have the pointer in C terminology or the reference in Java terminology to the first element. Then what might be easier? Is it easier to insert at the beginning or is it easier to insert at the end? What do you think? Put at start and make first pointer to it, Nicole, that's correct. So let me then ask the question in a different way why it's hard to insert at the end or what do I need to do to insert at the end? If I only have this address of the first element, what should I do? Any idea? First of all, to be able to insert at the end, I have to go to the end first, right? 
need to loop now that's a, yeah thank you so much that's correct you have to go through the entire one mark that's that's correct so simply you have to because you have only the start you have to keep jumping until you go to the end and then you insert afterwards right so again if you have n elements you would require n operations right which is similar to what you have to do if you insert at the beginning of the array right what does this tell us it tells us that really the efficiency of oh how that's interesting. Yeah, so what does this tell us? It tells us that the efficiency really depends on how you implement your list, correct? So now efficiency and actual implementation are related to each other, right? And here is giving like the example we discussed, inserting at the beginning is inefficient for the array, while it's like not efficient for the linked list to insert at the end, right? So efficiency depends on the actual implementation of the list. By the way, both are called lists, right? And, and this is one of the fundamental things about an abstract data type. When I say a list, I didn't tell you how did I implement it. You can implement it using an array, as I said, linked list, doubly linked list, other data structures, queue, for example, but it's still called the list, right? So the list is the abstract data type because you abstract the implementation. The way you implemented it is the actual data structure, right? So the difference between abstract data type and the data structure is the abstract data type tells you simply the type in an abstract way, no implementation details. So why the data structure is the implementation, right? Good. So taking this, so let's just here. So Taking this to what we discussed about the three elements or the three features of a type in a language, we said there are three things, right? First of all, the memory size. The second thing is the values that are allowed or valid. The third thing is the operations that are also valid or allowed in this type, right? So now this represents a type, correct? And let's see how abstract data type of a class, which one it covers and which one we need to look about the data structure to cover, right? An abstract data type, you only define the set of possible values, which is this one. And you also define the set of possible operations that you can do in uh, the type itself, which is the third one. But it doesn't tell you the actual representation, how do you implement it, or the actual implementation, which is really dependent, like the memory is dependent on it. Because remember, we said how to determine the memory needed for a certain object, you need to know how many instance variables are there and how many methods are there, right? So to do this, you need the actual implementation. So the first one depends on the implementation, which is the data structure, while the second two are just defined by the abstract, abstract, abstract data type, correct? To, to simplify this through the example we were discussing, the abstract data type is the list. And in a list, once you tell me that there is a list abstract data type, you have to tell me what are the possible values. For example, this is a list of ints, a list of doubles or whatever. And you have also to tell me what are the operations that I need to do, that I can do in this, uh, in this list. On the other hand, how much memory is needed or what is the actual representation of this list? This, you have to take me to how did you implement it? There are different ways. If it's through an array, I know, for example, you, you would need certain uh, memory size. You would represent your list elements as an array. So all of them are the same uh, size and all of these things. If you have done this using a linked list, so a certain entry has a different type and size and all of the things that are related to the actual implementation, right? So what we have done so far, we started from what we know about an inherent data type, the three features, and then we wanted to abstract how an abstract data type or a class you define. Abstract data type is really nothing other than you say, I want to write a class called list, right? I'm not going to tell you how did I implement it, but you only need the contract or the interface or the encapsulation information that we have been discussing in setters and getters. And we will see right now, how do we connect this with really with this setters and getters stuff, right? Yeah, so just to answer this question based on our discussion, what part of data type 
does the abstract data type leaves out? We said it leaves out the actual implementation detail or the representation, which determines also how much memory is needed for this class or this type, good? Perfect. So this takes us to the data structures, the actual implementation. As we said, you can define uh, um, the list or, or implement the list using different types. Let me stop for questions. Yan Hao, are you saying the operation of the list is up to the implementation of the list? No, no, Yan Hao. What I was saying, if, if we go back to this previous slide here, we said what operations are allowed on... Uh, let me just go. Yeah, here. So one operation is allowed on the list. It has to be part of your contract of the list, the abstract data type. But how did you implement the operation? Now it will be based on the data structure, right? So that's, for example, sorting, right? In lab three, you have done sorting using two different uh, algorithms, right? Uh, I guess in the last question, the only thing you need to tell me is that you have a sort and this sort is doing, for example, an increasing order. How did you implement the, the sort or the actual algorithm is up to the implementation. And this is the information you shouldn't be, uh, I would say, exposing to the outside wallet, right? What you only need to expose is the contract that your implementation supports a sort operation and this sort operation operates as the following in an increasing order, right? That's all. How did you implement it? It's up to you. You can use algorithm one, algorithm two, a third algorithm, an efficient one, not an efficient one. It's up to you, right? So just to put it again in a formal way, a data structure is nothing other than the way you implement your abstract data type or the way you organize the values or the instances of your data type in the memory, right? And that means when we talk about the data structure, we are really talking about the implementation of the ADT or the abstract data type, right? So again, ADT is that, you can think of this as the contract you expose to the outside wallet and the data structure is the implementation. So I would say this, I would draw something like this. Remember we had this and we said there is an interface here, which sitters and getters comes into account. The actual details here includes also the data structures you use to implement your abstract data type, but the outside wallet only sees the interface and this is the ADT. In the example we gave, you only need to tell me that you have a list, you have certain operations I can conduct on the list, while how did you implement it is part of the internal implementation that you should not expose to me, good? Done through this and yeah, good. So this also takes us to how to connect this EDT uh, idea with what we discussed about the interface of setters and getters. We said, you're telling me I shouldn't expose my actual implementation of the type I'm defining or the class I'm defining to the outside wallet, yes. How to do this? We said, you have to define your instance variables to be private, for example. Outside wallet shouldn't have an access to it. And then, uh, if they are private, well, they will not be able to access, to modify or to read. Then what would be the solution we discussed before is you have to have setters and getters, right? So again, this is just an example of setters and getters. We, 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 have, we have went through setters and getters before. This is also like some rules of how to define like set elements, get, get elements. But this, this revisits the point that we had before about setters and getters. Setters and getters allows you to keep control of your implementation as we discussed before. Uh, in our point class, for example, the X, Y coordinates, I can define them like this. And uh, if they are, if, they, if, if I leave them as public, which means I expose X and Y to the outside wallet, uh, assume later if I want to, or, or for example, I discover that it's more efficient to implement X and Y or the actual coordinates to be rather than uh, Cartesian, I want them to be like uh, the angle and distance, like the circular, um, uh, the circular coordinates, right? Well, if you have X and Y as public, you will never be able to do that, right? 
Why? Because this is a different variable right now, right? So if you change it X to be the theta or R to be the R, you will not be able to do that, right? I mean, of the outside world, I have built my program based on your implementation of X and Y. I interpreted them to be Cartesian coordinates. So you cannot just modify it, right? But then if you, if you define them to be private on the other hand, and so let's, let's draw it because that's an important example. And, and we already know this is X and Y. If I have direct access to X and Y, they have to represent uh, the Cartesian coordinates and you cannot use them for another uh, purpose inside your actual, um, I would say inside your actual implementation, right? But if you give me the setters and getters, this should be setters, this should be getters, then I can really modify X and Y to be anything as far as when you call the get inside my get implementation of the X, I can do the transformation. For example, later I discovered if I transform X and Y to be again theta and R, then it gives me, I don't know, like 100% better performance improvement or something like this, better memory utilization, whatever reason, it's easier for me to deal with for your use case. What do I need to do? for you as far as this is private and you only use get X and get Y. Can someone imagine how I can still use exactly the same program with the new implementation? What is the only thing as a programmer I need to change? What do you think? First of all, is the example clear? Like I started with X and Y to be the Cartesian coordinates for the point. We have been using this in the previous lectures. And then later I discovered, oh, if I do it as theta and R, it gives me much better improvement. I decided to go ahead with this development. The problem is if I have X and Y as public, I cannot do this because everyone is using X and Y for this purpose. But if I have X and Y as private, so I can internally manipulate them as I wish, as far as when you call get X from the outside wallet, it gives you the actual X coordinate, right? So the only thing I need to change as a developer is the implementation of get X where I can do the transformation from theta R to X, Y, and then return X to you, right? So, which means internally, I can deal with X and Y as theta and R, while externally, by this step of transformation, you still get X and Y to be the Cartesian coordinates, right? So again, we disassociated, yeah, change setters would work also, that's correct, Ian. So you have to change the get and the set, that's correct which means if I only change the way I'm providing to you the, the variable as far as it's consistent with our contract, I can do whatever the hell I want inside the implementation, right? This is usually referred to as uh, decoupling of concerns, right? Or separation of concern, which means the actual, my actual implementation, you don't have to care about, I can do whatever I want as far as I maintain a contract, right? And we call this interface the contract. So I hope this also kind of adds to your understanding of what we discussed before. So the contract is, is simply, any ADT is the contract and it, it, it simply specifies that, like the specifications. You wrote a certain code, you have to tell me, and software specification, again, is another, uh, another grad course or another research area that how to like put specifications for your software it's not just writing code, right? You have to be very clear about how you architect your code, how to put the specifications. Uh, and in fact, I can also add, um, this is a good idea. I might create a folder that I can refer you to some uh, references or like books or, or videos that tells you more about these things because these things are very important and they are not usually taught in an undergrad course. But if you're interested on how to write a better soft, software and unfortunately, these things are also you get asked about in interviews, right? Uh, so it might be useful for you for those who are interested. Uh, okay, I'll make sure I will do that. Good, so, so simply what is the contract? You need to specify the, again, this takes us back to the inherent data type three features. I need to specify the set of valid values, right? And then the set of valid operations as well. And that's all. What do I do in the implementation? You don't have to care. Right? So the name of the abstract type, the parameter types, the results, if there is a result and the behavior, right? I, 
by no mean I should specify the actual data representation, which means all my variables should be private. And uh, how did I implement the stuff? So the actual algorithm I wrote or the actual data structure I have used shouldn't also be exposed to the outside world, right? Why having a contract is an important thing because it's simply the agreement between you as a developer or maintainer or software uh, programmer and the actual user of your code, right? As a user, I only need this information to be able to use your implementation and I don't need to care how, do you, how did you write it. Think, for example, if, if later you work in a project and you have five colleagues in the project, if you do it in this way, it would be much modular than if everyone knows all the details of the implementation. If you change some, something, please go ahead and you ask your friend, oh, I changed it the way I implemented it. It doesn't work now. I need to change the contract. So hopefully, the first thing you should start with, you should set together as a team, come up with a contract of the interface. Everyone takes a class let's say four members, and what is the contract of the interface? And this contract is between everyone, as far as you adhere to this con contract or satisfy it, whatever implementation everyone comes with for his own part should really matter, right? So again, we achieve modularity here. Is there any question? I know it might seem like a bit theoretical right now, it's not our usual lecture, but that's a very important concept, right? So if, if you've got questions, please ask. Good. So again, as I said, separation of concerns is the main point behind encapsulation, the contract of the abstract data type, all and setters and getters, all these terminology adds up to the same thing, right? So what are some of the advantage, or I would say some of the good uh, advices to have uh, a contract? The first thing is you shouldn't promise more than what is necessary for the code. And this takes us back to the first question we, we ask, should I provide all the implementation for all these insertions or deletions in a list? Well, you should see what is necessary for the project and you only deliver what is necessary. So you only, as a developer, you should only develop the necessary functionality and the necessary functionality will be use case dependent. As I said, if you are developing a generic API or library, then well, be as much general as possible. But if you are writing a specific project or program, then provide only the functionality. So a good programming practice, also, although it might seem counterintuitive, but if you go for internships, for example, in industry, you will see this a lot, right? A good programming practice is to remove the functionality that is not needed, even if it's working, right? So for example, assume a user or a customer comes to your company would require a certain implementation of a project and he's, he asks for 10 operations, right? 10, 10 certain operations or 10 uh, uh, certain requirements he needs in his project. And then I would say like you were an excellent programmer, the manager gave you this project and you said, you know what I see, it's much easier to even extend this 10 to be 20 and you might please your, your manager and the customer, right? That's a bad behavior even if you have the 20 fully working correctly. Why that's the case? Can someone imagine? Because it, it, it might seem counterintuitive. So why this is not based on what we discussed so far? Why providing more functionality than the customer asked for is not really a good behavior? What do you think? Any idea? We have already discussed some of this, right? give more access and provide more potential issues, Katie, that's correct. More chances for error, that's correct, Sarah and Katie. That's, that's correct. And also more maintenance that is needed. And by providing more functionality, I mean, memory and, and, and running time is also another thing, Jolie, perfect, thank you. So the other thing you can think of is you just don't provide the project for the customer and you forget about it, right? Later, he will come up with bugs. You have to maintain it. And what if you want to extend your project for another customer? those functionality can also handicap you for, uh, for further extensions, right? So the good behavior is you remove the functionality that is not necessary, and then later it's easier to extend. So the general rule is if you provide only the functionality that is needed, it's easy to add functionality later, but it's almost impossible to remove functionality because once you exploit the functionality, the user will use it and you cannot take it away for compatibility reasons, right? 
And then the other, the other good advice here for the contract is your documentation shouldn't expose anything about the implementation at all, right? It should only provide the information we discussed here, which is like these two, like the, like the valid values and the valid operations. And those two are the only necessary things for the customer to use your code, right? Your documentation shouldn't mention how did you implement your stuff, right? Okay, so now this is with about the ADT, how to implement the ADT. This takes us to the real structure, which I believe we will uh, start from next week talking about, um, we have seen arrays as simple data structures, but we have never called them that. Although in fact, arrays are valid data structures. And we'll discuss uh, linked lists in more details as of next week. Um, and then for the implementation, you have to make sure your implementation matches the contract. So you have to make sure you represent all the necessary values for the IDT to be used. Again, they should be private as we said. And also the algorithm should be consistent with, with uh, what you expose to the outside world, right? Yeah, and this is what we already mentioned. If, if you already give your classes to others to use it, it's easy to add functionality, but it's almost impossible to remove. Good, responsibilities or again, separation of concerns. The class is responsible for its own values. So you have to protect them by having them as private and you should uh, write your class to be generally useful, uh, which means it should be reusable through getters and setters interface. And you shouldn't be responsible for anything that is outside of your contract, which means assume I give you the class point to use, right? Then later you came and you do what we have done in the previous lecture, which is writing the circle class. And then you are using the point inside. Assume that the circle class didn't work properly because of some other problems here. It's not the responsibility for the point class at all, as far as it adheres to the interface. The one who wrote the circle class, which is like us as well, but it's generally a different, like different, entity, different, different one, different company, then the responsibility for using the class will be based on this, I would say, let's call this programmer one, programmer two, and this is programmer one. As far as programmer one correctly implements the contract, then he shouldn't be caring at all how people are using it, right? Okay. So one example of this class reuse, which what we call last time class composition, is really the classes that Java gives you, right? I mean, there are some already existing classes in Java. We have already used some of them, which is a scanner class, for example, if you remember, to read something from uh, the screen. And those classes are written to be generic because they are written for any Java developer and they are very well maintained. Their interface is very well clear. If you look into the Java documentation or even online, you will see this specify, and th this is a way to learn how to write a good class and how to document it. it. You will see that in the implementation, they tell you, first of all, what does this scanner class do? What are the methods that you can use in the scanner class and what you expect as an output? Done, right? This is the, the documentation of a class. It doesn't tell you how did, how did they implement, for example, the uh, next int method to read an integer from, uh, from the screen. Right? It only tells you that you can use it. So to summarize, a data type describes the value, representation, and operation, the three things. In an abstract data type, you don't talk about representation. You only describe the values and the operations, and you leave the representation for the actual implementation. What you should expose to the outside world is the ADT, which is, again, the contract of the values and the operations. While you should maintain private the actual algorithm, and your data members in the representation, right? Again, all data types should be private. You only access them through getters and setters, which is the contract. And in abstract data type, you should define this contract and you should only provide necessary and sufficient operations. Questions? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Nicole. So scanner is a class, right? So the ADT is a generic term, right? So 
it doesn't, so the scanner class, for example, it doesn't tell you how they implement the stuff. So the way any class would really have to be both, the ADT and the implementation, right? Except for interface classes that we will come into later. And this is why also it's important to know this ADT concept, right? I'm just to, in order not to confuse you, except for some special types of classes, which don't have any implementation, they only define the contract, all classes should have both the contract and the implementation, which means they are both the ADT and the rail structure. Think, for example, on our Boeing class or circle class, we have the setters and getters to be our contract or interface, which means now as an outside world, I don't need to know the implementation of, the, of your Boeing class or circle class, so it's an ADT, while internally, we also implemented the methods and wrote the algorithms for this. And we defined our data representation and instance variables, which means also it's a bit of a data structure here, right? So any class would be both. It depends on, are you looking from the outside wallet or are you looking internally? So maybe it's better to visualize. This is the class. Let's say it's a point, for example. Here, you are the developer. You are inside this, I would say, protected region. Then you can think of this as the real structure. While from the outside wallet, if I'm like sitting here, oh, I get disconnected. So you guys, you guys still hearing me, correct? Okay, I'm yeah. assuming I'm back. Yeah, thanks. So what I'm saying is it depends really where are you looking from? If you are the developer inside this black box, then the class would have the actual implementation of the rest structure. But if you are in the outside wallet, then you are looking into the class as the ADT, good? And, and this is a journey for any class, except some special types of classes that we will have a separate lecture for them, which only defines the interface and leaves the implementation for later. Yeah, from our point of view, that's correct. We only need to care about how it operates, which is the contract, which is the ADT, right? So ADT is something not physical, it's more of, um, a logical view of the class. So yes, I would say yes. If you're looking for a direct answer for us, yes. For that developer who wrote it, it's both, right? Can you show what a contract looks like again, Arjun? Yes, so the contract is if you, you simply need to think of these three things on, in, of any type, right? The contract does not provide the representation. It provides the values and the operation, which is for example, for uh, for the list, I will tell you, you can have list of ints and uh, the operations you can do in this list is sort, search, delete, for example. How did you implement sort in the representation? I don't care. How do you define your end variables or instance variables? I don't care. So this is what is the contract is, right? So again, going back to this slide, this is the implementation. Hey, where is the contract here? And the contract should specify the set of valid values of the ADT and the set of operations, right? That's that's all what you need to define. So this is something that it's basically a summary of the class then, or I guess it depends on your ADT, but um, it's a summary of yeah. what it holds and what it can do to the value it holds. Correct, without exposing the implementation, yes. Okay, that's and yeah. exposing the implementation includes mentioning whether it's public or private or it doesn't. Exposing the implementation, one of one ways to expose it is to define your innocence variables to be public, and we said this is something bad. And another way of exposing the implementation is that in your contract or your in your documentation, you state how did you implement your methods, for example. You say, oh, I used the, uh, uh, bubble sort to sort my, like for the, for the sort function, for example, right? So you specify the actual algorithm you have used or the actual data structure. For example, you say, I implement this list using the linked lists or doubly linked lists where you can do one, two, three, right? So this is also exposing implementation. So exposing implementation means putting instance variables to be public or expose the data structures used or expose the algorithms used. Okay, but this is like, 
Or something you would put in the documentation of your code, right? You shouldn't. This is what we are saying. This depends no, no, on no, really. But the contract as a whole, you would put in your documentation. Ah, the contract. Yeah, that's correct. The contract assembly, uh, a way that simplifies doc documentation. So, oh, if, okay. if, like in industry, the first point of documentation is the contract, right? Which is usually called user specification as well, right? And then you take it for documentation. That's correct. Okay. Okay. So it's not, you don't like, code a contract, a contract simply an explanation of uh, what yeah, your it's an explanation. ADT that's, does. That's okay. correct, that's correct, that's correct. Okay, I'll say for that for where we are, or dot. So our side for these two files, you shouldn't care about them at all, and you should leave them as is. Those are only needed to be able to run your code in our Linux machines using our scripts and also in GitHub. So you shouldn't be touching these, you shouldn't be caring about them, right? Cham, I'm, to be honest, I don't remember. I don't think Tuesday lecture was posted. Oh. I need to check, I believe. I need to check. I'm, I'm, I, I would, yeah, I, I don't think Tuesday was, was posted. Yeah, Wednesday was posted, but I guess Tuesday uh, was processing at the time I locked. So let me relog that. Katie, how do you use the expose? How would you use, expose the structures in implementation? How can you avoid this? Yeah, so simply what we are discussing in this lecture by saying, you need to follow three main steps, which is only provide the necessary contract, which is through setters, getters, everything, every data should be private. The second thing is don't state how to do implement your methods. You only provide the prototype for the methods. And uh, you don't mention the, uh, the actual data structures, like whether they are linked lists or not. So these are the three advices, like the three main advices that you need to avoid exposing any, any implementation details. Nicole, so Oracle holds the ADT info. I guess you are referring to the scanner class back again. So that's correct. The company that has Java source code. Yes, they, they have this. Moaz. So the idea behind all this is for ADT is just to give the user the info they need about how to use it, but not the info how we implemented it. To the point, Moaz, that's correct. Is there any other question? Again, I would say some would, would would see this lecture not very, I would say, interesting because the theoretical information it has. But from my experience, I'm telling you, this is one of the most important lectures you'd encounter, both about thinking about how to think about software, how to go for interviews and think how you really, because you, are, you shouldn't be a programmer, that's the point. You should be a software developer. And there are two big differences between both, right? Testing is one way which we address through our unit tests. How to maintain your code is another way. And how to think about those contracts is also another way, right? So no one in industry writes software just by going ahead and like writing a program. Those, those factors are what differentiates between a good software developer or an engineer and someone else. But isn't most interview allows you to use whatever language Aaron, yes, it has nothing to do with language. Like again, ATT is a concept that is independent of the language, right? Uh, so it's a more of a methodology of, 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 of addressing whatever question you have or whatever project you have. So yes, it has nothing to do with language, right? So it's, this, is not, this is why I started the lecture by saying this ATT terminology and most of the terminology we have for object-oriented programming, in fact, are not Java limited, right? So they are more of concepts that across all, all programming languages, uh, but we just have to pick one language to see the examples. Otherwise, all the lectures will be like this and people will become bored, right? So we have to implement as well, but implementation is only, again, one example. We can do this in C++, Java, other language, Python, uh, but, uh, but the concepts are the important ones. Yan how are we gonna post this lecture today or another day? Um, usually for, for all the lectures I didn't post throughout the week, I do this Saturday morning. So hopefully by, by tomorrow, you should have all the lectures. Moaz, if you expose your implementation, what could be some consequences? Uh, someone is going to reverse engineer your, your work and you'll not be able to license your, your software if you are a big company. And there are many problems like this 
in, in the industrial world, right? Uh, can we treat Citra and Gitter as a way to access data structure? Yes, rookie. The sitters and getters are really your actual soul, I would say soldiers for this interface or contract. That's correct. Okay, good. So if there are no more questions, uh, I will say thanks everyone and I will uh, uh, see you all uh, next week. Have a great weekend then. Bye-bye.